my office in a hurry, and I'm always in a hurry, I grabbed the wrong bunch, and so I left my office with the wrong handout, but you will get the idea. The first one <laughs> is, uh, uh, this is wonderful. Uh, let me explain to you. We devised this to work with uh, problem drinkers, and there's no reason why you cannot adapt this. Huh? Problem drinkers. There's no reason why you cannot adapt this to other problems, and we have done that. You could do that with couples, you could do that with children, parents bringing the children, adapt the same thing, okay? And so instead of having a problem list, most of these check sheets are problem focused, and I didn't like that. So we changed it to solution focused checklist. So for example, um, uh, enjoy sex without alcohol. My family friend is proud of me. Uh, accept alcohol-free lifestyle. That kind of stuff, okay? I can um, go to work and school regularly. Uh, the client can talk about. And then, to make things even more solution-focused, we uh, put it down as uh, the, the clients are given okay. uh, options. Merci of seldom, sometimes, pretty much, and very much. So what I do is, when they check this in their waiting room, they have uh, checked this, and there is no column that says never. Okay? It's not allowed to say never. So they have to say something. Uh, so I grab this. And then I say, oh, as soon as I sit down, tell me about how is it that you are able to limit your number of drinks sometimes. That becomes an immediate solution talk. So it's a very nice form. You can, uh, again, I would suggest you feel free to adapt this to your client population. I do this all the time. Okay? Share with your neighbors. Uh, the other one, again, uh, I thought I was going to do a workshop on alcohol uh, problems, so I brought this wrong uh, handout. But again, the solution model, solution building model is the same. So just take out the alcohol problem, and then here you are. Okay? So I hope everybody had a good lunch. Hmm? You have a good lunch? Good. Uh, yes, we are continuing on from this morning, I guess, basically. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, this is part two. Part two. Part two, what's part two? Oh, we said, I promised somebody I was going to talk about second session. Yeah, yeah. okay. So. So since we saw you this morning, what's better? <laughs> what's better for you since this morning? Oh, I, I've gotten the uh, kind of training I came here for. Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> you can leave now. <laughs> <laughs> so what's better? And that's how we start our second session. Same thing with third session. Same thing with fourth session. Or Always 27th start session if there is yeah. such a thing. Always starts with, so, as soon as Pause. they sit down, so. Pause. By the way, so is a real nice way to change the topic, okay? You, when you want to, client goes on and on and on about problems, right? And you heard enough, and you want to change the topic. Before they take a next breath, you jump in and say, so. <laughs> Pause. <laughs> then you have a floor, <laughs> okay? And they change the topic. Uh, again, we have, uh, it's our responsibility to, to control the what topic the client gets to talk about. Is there paying us for this, you know? <clears throat> and so we start with, so what's better? Uh, usually, they will tell you, majority of them, and when they're searching for, again, their memory, 
right, in their computer memory for what's better, what's better. We're not saying, again, make sure you don't say, is anything better since we met last time? We're not saying that. We're saying, what is better since we met last time? And the majority of them will say, something is better. Okay? Majority of them will say that. Give them lots of time. It's sort of, a, again, the use of a silence, and they listen very carefully, and then they will, it's, again, the floor is theirs. So they will think about what's better. And again, then you want to go for details. Details. Somebody said, Detail is what individualizes the treatment. It's the nitty gritty everyday detail. Uh, when, how you got up in the morning and you know, how you got, uh, got out the door and how you went to work and what happened on the way to work, those details are what makes that person's life very unique. So don't ignore these details. Uh, then when they tell you how they did it, then again, the next step is what do you have to do so you can do more of how you made things better for yourself? The, oftentimes, clients will say, when you say, so, what's better? Oh, they nothing say, much. About the same. Okay? Yeah, it's about the same. Again, when they do that, the best response you can do, make is silence. And then they'll start, sometimes, if you sit there for six or seven seconds, after they say, that's about the same, after six or seven seconds, they will, they will at least sometimes will come up with, well, Johnny did get to school on time one day last week. And away you go. <laughs> then off you go. Okay. Uh, I think that what happens when client's answer is same, nothing has changed since we met last time, nothing is different. I think that what, hap what seems to, to us, what happens is that they are looking for big changes huge changes. It took them six months to get to a therapist office. And uh, if nothing changes just like this, then that's about the same. Okay, again, our uh, premise, our assumption is that things are always on the move. Clients' lives, people's lives are on the move, always changing. Uh, so since they have not, they are looking, when they are looking for big changes, it's very difficult for them to notice the small changes. And so you can help them with that. Um, again, uh, our goal is to get them to do more of whatever they did. Um, another uh, sort of a suggestion we have is if they insist that nothing is different, nothing is better, you need to go back and say, okay, you were here on Tuesday. How did Tuesday go? Nobody remembers how Tuesday went. It's very difficult for us to remember what last Tuesday was like. <laughs> or how yesterday. We don't even remember what happened yesterday. So they are searching for, yes, what happened Tuesday, Tuesday. And they go like this and say, oh, well, yeah, Tuesday. Tuesday, actually, that was a pretty good day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, how come? Oh, I remember I talked to George. I hadn't met, seen George in six months. And, and then you can start from there. Off they go. Okay. But it's even more, this is even more the case with the third option. It's actually things are so-called worse. Mm -hmm. um, I've done a little informal research on this. We call it so-called worse. <laughs> and what this means <laughs> is that within the previous 36 hours, something bad has happened. And that's taken over the control of the answer to this question. Um, it's sort of like if you go to a concert and you, you're the, you know, you've got this cello player and he's up there sawing away um, doing Kodai's suite for unaccompanied cello and he hits a long note. What people, and that, but the rest of the thing, the rest of this 20 minute piece is perfect. 
and the five minutes before was perfect. But this is one bad note. When the intermission comes, what are people talking about? The bad note. And he's talking to himself, now how did I recover from this? Because that's the important thing. How do you recover once you've made a mistake? Oh, that's, musicians are trained that way. Uh, but nobody else, I guess. But usually it means something has happened in the, pre you know, the previous 24 to 36 hours that has colored the response. It has nothing to do with the entire interval in most cases. And how did Wednesday go? <laughs> the day after you were here last time, how did that go? And they'll start to tell you about things that were better on Wednesday. Now, of course, better, same, or worse are all a matter of construction. It's something, I don't think of it as something that has actually happened in between sessions. This is a description of what happened between sessions. So whether it turns out that the interval between sessions was better, same, or worse, is as much a matter of your work with them as it is what they did between sessions. It's your job to help them construct things as better. And that's what the interview is for. Uh, so the question is, uh, what happened on Tuesday? The client said, actually, it was a pretty good day. Then do you continue to ask what happened, or do you ask what is better? Oh, yeah. Detail. But, but do you use better or do you stay with happened? No, no, no. What happened? Okay. So you, what made, what so you did don't you use do? better anymore because they didn't no, accept it at first. Right, that's okay. right. That's right. What, what did you do? What did you do right? Yeah. What did you do right? Yeah. It's amazing how people react to being accused of doing something right. <laughs> Always amazed me. Okay. Very, are, very strangely sometimes. Uh, there are clients who insist, though, it's been horrible since I was here last Tuesday. It's been horrible. Nothing but disaster. Maybe everything some. went wrong. Mm -hmm. Okay. No need to argue about it. If they insist that everything was worse, no need to argue about it. So then there are a couple of different ways of handle that. Um, one is, so how did you cope? It was that terrible. The life was horrible. How did you cope? That's one way to handle that. Um, the other one is, how come, how come it's not worse? How come it's not even worse? If they still insist it was just horrible, miserable life since we, we met last time, which is very unlikely they would say that. It's a very, I, I have to remind you, it's just a very small minority of clients will say that. Yeah, it's uh, so it's not going to happen occasionally, I mean frequently, but again, you can handle it two different ways. So how did you keep it from getting worse than this? What are you doing that kept it from getting worse? Obviously they should do more of that. Whatever it is that they did to prevent things from getting even worse yet, they should do more of that. So when they have an answer, again, mm -hmm. do more. This one too. Do more. Oh, we have a question over here. Yes, a side question. Um, uh, the MRI approach sees the problem maintained by the attempted solutions. What, what do you see maintaining the problem uh, from the solution-oriented point of view? That isn't you. Uh, we agree absolutely with MRI. That it's the attempted solution that maintains the problem, but that's you know, that's before therapy starts. We don't deal with it. That's just given. We don't inquire over a simple solution. Mm -mm. That's a given. That's just the way life is. People, that's the way people behave, normally and reasonably. So we aren't going to investigate that. We don't think we need to. So what will you be doing when the problem is gone? So I think that, again, uh, second session and later session, these are generally the format, and what that will get repeated over and over. Mm -hmm. uh, there is one other thing that we, we think is very useful, 
to talk to tell you about. I was going to say about the uh, scaling question. That's exactly oh, what great. I was going okay. to do. Okay, great, great. You want to do it or shall I? No, 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 go ahead. Oh, come on. Maybe you should. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Flip a coin. <laughs> Flip a coin. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, what we frequently do in the first session, um, almost, well, more than frequently, almost always, almost always, we will establish this kind of a scale that 10 stands for the day after the miracle. 10 stands for the day after the miracle. And 0 stands for how things were at the point you picked up the phone to make the appointment to come to see me. Okay, That's what 0 stands for. So it's the day after the miracle and the phone call. Okay, and then we will say things something like, and where are you on the scale today? This is even in the very first session. Okay. The most frequent answers in the first session are three, four, and five. Three being the most typical answer. So I'm ready between the telephone call, setting up the appointment, and 10 standing for the problem solved, right, the day after the miracle. Most clients have gotten to three or something like that by the e end of the first interview. Okay. And actually, there is a certain percentage who will give, tell you it's five or above in the first session. And you can pretty well predict this is a one session case. But not with any certainty, but you can make that prediction. So in the second session, if they, no matter what they will, their answer better, same, worse, we can use the scales to help again. So where are you on this scale between 0 and 10 today? Well, they'll say, well, 3.5. Oh, really? 3.5, hey, that's pretty good. How did you do that? Now, you don't, I'll tell you this little secret here. Don't say the question this way. Last week you were at three. Where are you today? You know what will happen if you do it that way? Three. That's the most likely response is this three or lower. But if you don't remind them, the most likely response is going to be above what it was the week before. So how did you do this? How did you go from 3 to 3.5? How did that happen? What's the difference between 3.5 and 3? What's the difference? If your wife were here, where would she say you are on this scale? <laughs> Where would the dog say you are? Get back to our illustration this morning, in that case, huh? Where would the dog say you are? What did he say? The dog thought he was between five and six. Yeah. He was higher than he rated himself. Um, no. Yeah, yeah. He's his reasoning was wonderful. He said, my dog thinks I'm the most wonderful person. It's an unconditional acceptance, he says. My dog accepts me unconditionally. Yeah. But the dog <laughs> could notice this fine distinction, you know. So. But the dog can't tell the difference yet. <laughs> I guess his wife did too. Uh, but not a, nowhere near as easily as the dog. And so it gives us some way to help the client tell themselves that they are making progress. Okay. This is, uh, I think is important about this. It's the client that's telling himself that he's making progress, not that we're telling him. He says, I've gone from up to 3.5. Oh. 
Usually they will then say something like, yeah, and last week was three, wasn't it? Most people will remember. And I think that our part in this constructing this improvement, 3.2, 3 3.5, there are many things that we can do as a therapist in response to that. And uh, my favorite thing that I like to do is that you did what? How did you ever know that would be good for you? <laughs> okay, that's all it takes. Or sometimes you can say, say that again? <laughs> I'm at 3.5. What did you say? <laughs> I'm at 3.5. Great. Wow, how did you do that? So those are all the stuff that we do as, again, participant observer. Uh, what is going on, and we help create this different and improved new reality for them by using ourselves as an instrument. And how will you know, and the, the following, the next step is, how will you know you've gotten the four? How will your wife know that you've moved up one step, or one half step? Um, and try and get as much details from that. How would your wife know you'd done this? How would the dog know? Oh, the dog would know because I would bring home one of these huge soup bones for him. <laughs> okay. I'll take him for a walk. I'll take him for a walk, right. a long yeah. walk. Yeah. I'll take him Actually, for a walk. I'll be jogging, and yeah. this is good for the dog if I jog. Uh, the other way to ask the same question, but let me just sort of give you a different, uh, uh, for those clients who are very reluctant to, to talk about how things will get better, because we are always pushing for what will have to happen to make things better. The clients are somewhat reluctant, then another way to do that, suppose you moved up from 3 to 3.5. So again, here comes the suppose question. Very nice, very handy question to you. Suppose you just, I don't know how you're going to get there, but suppose somehow you move from 3.5. What will you be doing then that you're not doing right now? So again, get them to imagine the solution state or a little bit improved state. What would you suppose, what would you suppose your wife would notice different about you that would tell her that you have moved up from 3. Point to 3.5? Uh, again, it's a, it's a, okay, that's another way to do that. Uh, suppose your wife would, were here. What is, you know, and I say, you know, sometimes I have an ch empty chair. <laughs> suppose she was here. And if I were to ask her, what do you suppose she will say, she will notice different about you that would tell, let her know that you moved from 3 point to 3.5. And then that's followed with, so when she notices this, what would she do different? Um, lots of questions of, again, the uses, the concept of difference is, is repeated. Um, and uh, the other one that we get, we repeat a lot I instead. So what will you do instead? Because the clients will usually talk in terms of a negative things, what I will not do. Uh, I will not be yelling at my wife. So what will you do instead? Uh, he won't be lying to me anymore. So what would he do instead? Uh, so always this sort of the, the indicator of a positive sign rather than absence of problems. Yeah. Somebody was saying something? No, there was another question. Okay. All right? Okay. Then another thing we will do. Uh, on the scale. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Is... Um, well, okay, if you're at 3.5, whatever it might be, mm -hmm. the question then comes up, how are you going to maintain this improvement? We're always talking about this. How are we going to maintain this? But what do you need to do in order to stay at 3.5 or at around 3.5? It's 3.5 is on this directional arrow, right, going towards 10, and you sort of, you have to maintain your 3.5 in order to get to 4. 
clients usually will have that idea. That you have to maintain it in order to keep going up. So we'll talk a lot about that. What do you need to do to maintain it? What will your wife, what's your wife doing that's helping you to maintain this? So we may end up with a homework task. We want you to observe what you do and what happens around you that helps you maintain this 3.5, or even begins to move things up towards 4. That's a fairly frequent task. And then there's other ones. We have all sorts of different scales. Uh, we have another scale which would be How confident are you that you can maintain this improvement? With 10 being, you're as sure about this as anything you, you can possibly be about anything. And zero is there's not a snowball's chance in hell of maintaining this. Where are you on that today? Good, good. That's, that, that's pretty amazing, considering you, this change has only been a week old. What will it take to move it up to three? And the same kinds of questions will then come in around well, this scale of confidence. Yeah? Mm -mm. No, no, don't want to write it down. No. No. Uh, no, the reason for that is they may come up with something better during the, during the coming week. So you don't want them to lock into something that is limiting. If anything, I think the therapy is a way to open up the, the, some new way or more creative ways to solve their problems. Uh, so that would be too limiting, I think. That's the reason that I would not do something like that. We, we did that at one time. We used to write it down once in a while, for, but they almost got into then arguing about over the literal nature of the text. Yeah. And so, you know, um, the family would go home and then fight about what the, tech, what the homework assignment actually meant and was, because it was written down there. Um, and they'd never get around to doing the task. Uh, the other, uh, the good uh, things to uh, uh, scale is willingness. How willing are they to work to solve this problem, solve this particular problem that brought them here? Uh, again, with 10 standing 10 for, for damn, you do damn near anything to solve the problem, to zero standing for, well, the opposite of that? Now we used to, one of the traps I hear is uh, people, when they try and use this, is they somehow or another get the idea that there is some sort of, um, oh, like, if they say that they're willing to do some, a 3.5, okay, that, that's their level of willingness, is 3.5. Um, I think a lot of people interpret that answer as being limiting. But that, is, mean, that means that there are 65% of the t all tasks they won't do. Rather than thinking about the other way, this means they're going to do at least 35% of the task. It's a lot higher than zero. So if a client says that we're at 3.5 on doing tasks, I said, that's wonderful. Good. Okay. That means there are some t some tasks he will do. Mm. No, no. I usually stop there. No, let them commit themselves that they were going to do thirty-five percent of the task. Or, yeah. Okay. Uh, but that has little or no impact on what we actually do. 
as far with, as the, the homework some test cases, we give. Some cases, especially those cases that are sent by other community agencies, you may want to have them scale what would your probation officer say where he thinks you're at on the same scale. And they usually are very low than they give themselves for on the scale. Oh, he'd, he'd say I'm at a one or a zero maybe. Yeah. He would only say I'm one because I showed up today or something like that. And then you can again go for what do you suppose he needs to see you do for him to think that you have moved that from one to two, one point to two point. So again, that helps them figure out what the probation officer see, needs to see me do uh, to improve his assessment of me. So again, this relationship question that I was talking about this morning, I think that goes back to. Uh, now see, this two here is not on an only two. And don't think of it as low. Not at all. Yeah, I remember that one case of yours where um, on this scale about you, know, you got a two answer and um, people behind the mirror were saying, oh, geez, only a two. Right? Insu sits there and waits after the woman says she was at two. Maybe you smiled. I couldn't see your face at the time, but I don't know what you were doing. But there's this long pause on, and then the woman says, that's really damn good for me. Okay, well, and Insu picked that up, and away you went with two being mar a marvelous, dif huge difference between zero and two. For her, that was a huge difference. Uh, oh, and that this brings up another one. Is that the distance between the various points on the scale is not equal. Zero to, zero to five can be larger or smaller than five to ten. Don't worry about that. Clients adjust these things for you. They'll tell you about it. It's a very flexible scale. Um, the other way also can uh, use it is uh, progress that they are making in therapy. Um, how far have you come? You've been coming here for how many sessions? Three sessions? Uh, or five sessions or whatever, six months or whatever, uh, where would you say you're at? Ten means, ten stands where you don't have to come back to see me anymore. And one stands for how bad things were when you first came to see me. Uh, where are you on that between uh, uh, one or zero and ten? Um, and then you can also go for what has to happen to go from six to seven. Okay. Uh, the other one is uh, when they get to the point of a seven, then how confident are you that you can stay at seven? So you have another scale on the side. How confident are you that uh, next, let's say next three weeks or next two weeks or next month, you can stay at seven? If their confidence is very high, then you don't have to see them for three weeks, for example, or two weeks or for a month. And that's usually... Um, you know, they will let you know how confident they are. In most cases, most clients will s say, when they get to seven, that that is good enough. That's the top of most sc people's scale. Yes. Yeah. Seven, seven or eight. And yeah. Then and you, you know they're going to terminate. At follow up six months later, um, they will probably have moved up a whole point. Um, the average client moves up point eight in the six months between the final session and follow-up. Uh, how about a client who doesn't want to stop the work, either because I haven't done solution-focused work and I've done long, longer-term work than I want, or for some other reason people just like coming in? Uh, what's the way that you help facilitate people realizing that they've accomplished what they need? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> therapy, therapy junkies. Um, um. It's a, a two-part answer. Uh, mine and then ensues. Uh, <laughs> Always. Um, because my answer is more correct. <laughs> no, no, no. Hers is always more correct. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. Don't, don't, disillu don't make an illusion. <laughs> the, um, I, well, I guess I would have to say I don't, I don't let that be a problem. Um, I can't remember it ever happening.
to me. Um, and it's a very rare event when it does happen at all. And I think it has to do with the fact that we start off that first session with questions around how are we going to stop. It just doesn't come up. Uh, Part the two. Other, yeah, the other possibility, maybe you may want to space out the session a little bit less frequently. Yeah, so that, you know, meet less often. I think it might be a way to discover the day. She survived without you for two weeks, for example. Uh, and then you can say, my God, how did you, you know, how did you do it? Well, I guess that's uh, something we've changed in the last couple of years. What's that? Is the scheduling business. Um, generally speaking, what we do now is uh, ask them when they want to come back and try and accommodate that as much as possible rather, rather than saying, we'll see you next week at Wednesday at 3 o'clock. Um, we work with uh, inner city clients primarily. 67% are our Title 19, 54% are Afri African American, I think, something like that. And there, you know, their reputation is they aren't very good at keeping appointments. Um, but they're a hell of a lot better keeping appointments if they have the choice about when it is. Actually, since we started doing this, saying, well, so when do you think you should come back? When do you want to come back? Our sh the can't failed appointments has decreased significantly. Oh, yeah, I suppose we're usually done within an hour. Most sessions are. Oh, yeah. Um, less, everything is less. We're not bridges about anything. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, no, we're not rigid about that. Uh, but most sessions, well, my sessions run, the interview section runs about 30, 35 minutes. The pause runs about five minutes. And then the intervention message, or whatever you call it, um, is another five minutes. Um, Insu's interviews go longer. Because I'm more giving person. That's, that must be it. <laughs> That's true. That's yeah. Okay. <laughs> I have a question that when you have a couple and, um, you know, the, the situation where, you know, I want her to change. Yeah. You know, she's driving me right. crazy. Sure. And you explained this morning about how, okay, and when she uh, is no longer nagging you, or whatever, what would you be doing then? And, and you get to, you know, that person's behavior. That person, let's say he, is re responding to how he would react to a non-nagging wife, let's say. Um, Right, and he can describe, let's say, what he would be doing if she had done all these changes that he wants right. her to do. Right. What do you say at that point to get him to start doing those changes even though they're not in response? Because my guess is he's going to want to say, well, she has to, I'll do those things if she changes that. Right. So how do you get him to start doing some of those changes? Well, um, before I would even ask him to do any of those, be, you know, is I would make sure that she wasn't in the room. Okay. And so I would be, I would talk to him about this as perhaps some sort of a strategy. Um, you know, depending on his, his language, obviously. Uh, but try and get him to do as many of those kinds of things that he might do. Uh, after the, the miracle, his responses. Uh, the oddball chance that maybe if he does this, she'll change. That's one way. I have a better way. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I know that. What do you yeah. think I've been hanging around watching you work for 20 years? <laughs> okay. uh, and yeah. I've, been try I've been sitting behind the mirror for 20 years now, <laughs> watching her work, try and her, with her clients, and, and, and then she, they do this stuff, and. Um, I say, but that shouldn't work. <laughs> but it does. And so the theory changes, and uh, the maps change. Okay. Um, she's, uh, a, she's a master. Again, I think that the crucial piece is you don't want to stop at she will not nag at me anymore, or he will not withdraw anymore. That's, uh, that's too, what you, it's not a good idea to stop at that point. You want to 
get them to help them get to the point of what I will do more positively rather than what I will not do, okay? What I will actively do that is helpful. And so you spend a lot of time with both of them. So what will you do when she smiles at you? Well, I'll smile back. Uh, and once you smile back, then yeah, what will happen what, what next? Will she do? What comes after this? What comes after this? Lots of time spent on the solution picture, solution behavior, details of solution behavior. And then the, it's very seldom you're going to hear that, well, she has to do this first before I will do anything. Yeah. You're not, not going to hear that at all. You they see. are so eager to go home and try this yeah. because they could see where this could possibly lead to. They could see because the solutions sure. are coming from sure. them. If we might then give this couple uh, the famous homework task. Okay, the two of you go home now and uh, on sep separate and different days at random, right, you pretend the miracle has happened no matter what the other person does on that day. You pick two days and you pick two days. Keep it a secret from each other. Do you see, see if does? you can figure out which two yeah. days she does. You see if you can figure out which two days he, he does. Usually they can't figure it out. They're al almost always at least half wrong on their guesses about when the other person was doing the miracle. So their job is to keep it a secret which two days you're going to, you have picked as your miracle day. And your job is to guess which day my husband picked as his miracle day. And observe how she reacts when you do these things. Got that? Yeah. When they have a detailed description of detail description of miracle picture, uh, they can uh, again depends on the client. Some clients I may decide, ask them to do it just once, one day, pick a one day as a miracle day, and pretend the miracle has actually happened and do everything you would do on this day that you picked as if a miracle has actually happened. And uh. so what it does is uh, the other person is sitting there and listening to this. And I'm, you know, my husband is sitting there and his therapist is telling him to do this. And I'm supposed to do this too. But now I'm going to think, oh, he's going to pretend this. Now which day is it going to be? So I'm looking for his miracle day rather than when he's not paying attention to me. of this task is that neither of them actually have to do anything it is in order for the task to be effective. As long as she thinks he did it. He did it. He did it. Yeah. Because it's her response that matters there. As long as he thinks she did it, she the did task it. will work. Yeah. So one day task? One day. Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. See if you can figure out which day it was. Which day was. They, they she picked as her miracle day. Yeah. And, and so say, just a minute, they're usually at least half wrong. And so they're responding to what they imagine the other people, person is doing to pretend the miracles happen. And they are then reinforcing this, whatever it might be. Some do. Some, you can, Some do. You can, but yeah. you don't have to. Really. Most clients won't. Yeah. yeah. They're Some not very will. good at that. Most clients are not very good at keeping track of all this documenting, writing down. Especially our clients. Yeah. I mean, our clients, they don't even know how to read. Yeah, we, our secretary spends a lot of time reading, you know, the permission forms and so on to our clients. Okay. Um, oh, we have a question oh, over here. Oh, good. So you said you didn't debrief uh, homework specifically. Would you do it in this case? Ask how the that went. No. Not necessarily. No. Sometimes. Yeah. 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 You they will usually bring it up. It's, you know, if they bring it up, then we will track with them. Yeah. If not, we won't. So we don't want to get into this uh, policing function. Did you do a task? Can you apply that at mother and child? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Sure. Exactly the same way. And uh, the child is to keep it a secret from his mother, which day he picked. Yeah. Actually, we, a, a child invented this task. We learned this from a child, from a kid. We had Excellent. this case years ago, 
where the parents spent, oh, I don't know, but the greatest majority of the hour complaining about this 12-year-old brat. And um, it led me by the end of the hour to ask them point blank, is there any adult that likes this kid? Their answer was no. Nobody in their network liked this kid. And uh, I don't remember if we gave him a homework assignment or not, but the next session, um, the family came in and they were, um, they, they had no complaints about this kid in the intervening week. And so I asked the kid, you know, how did this happen? And um, he said, well, I've been pretending that this miracle we talked about last week, I've been pretending that happened. Well, you know, that was a marvelous idea. So from there on, we started giving this task to children and having parents observe. And from there, it's spread out to lots of other contexts where we use it. OK. Uh, I guess we will be uh, leaving out the big chunk if we uh, didn't talk about uh, self-esteem in California. Since we are in California, we have to talk about self-esteem. Right? Oh, I guess I, get a, I have to rest then <laughs> while you do that. <laughs> and there's a real nice uh, uh, self-esteem uh, uh, question in uh, using the scaling question. Um, this is how I do it usually. Let's say, and some clients are very hung up on self-esteem, right? I mean, that's their that's their language. And especially kids who school harp on this. Uh, right, teachers and the parents. Teachers love uh, self-esteem. Teachers, teachers love self-esteem, so uh, they come with this. Yes. Sure, sure. I could do that. Sure, sure. Um, and uh, their concern has to do with self-esteem. And uh, so then I would say, let's say 100, number 100 stands for the kind of ideal person you always wanted to be for yourself. OK, that stands for 100. And how close are you to being 100 today? By the way, when you ask the scaling question, it's important for you to mention today. When you say it's uh, sort of a limiting in terms of a time, we're just, we're just talking about today. Tomorrow it could go up or it could go down. We're just talking about today. Um, she said, this was a young woman who was real depressed, uh, 21 or 22 or something. And she said, 22. Who knows what 22 means to her? I have no idea, OK? And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what she means by 22. But you also have no idea whether that's good or bad at this point. We have no idea. So I said, OK, so 22. So what was the highest you have ever come close to being 100 in your, in your lifetime, 21 years of a lifetime? And she came up with 75. So then I spent a lot of time asking about 75. When was this? And how did that happen? And what were you doing? And what was going on in your life? And, and she had a lot of discretion about that. That was only about two or three years ago. She had a boyfriend. And she had lots of friends. And uh, uh, she had a job. And uh, she was in school. And a lot kind of a, lots of stuff. Um, so when you have something like that, then you can go either, again, Depending on the client reaction, you can go for make a big jump, and what would it take for you to be 75 again? You could go that way. Or some clients who will tell you this is not possible, but they let you know in many ways. Then you can go for then what would it take for you to be at 25? So small step, you either go for a big jump. That's your clinical judgment you have to use. Um, anyway, so it's a again a very nice way to to address this uh, the self-esteem issue. Uh, the other one you could do is with children. Uh, from teachers, they come with this kind of uh, you know, the issues. Then you can also ask, on a scale of 1 to 10, how much do you like being at 22? You know, if they say, I like being at 22, then you know, don't mess with it. But if they don't like being at 22, 
uh, they want to be more over here at 75, then you may want to, then what would it take for you to get there? Okay, so it's a real nice one. Uh, speaking of the children who come from school uh, or sent by school, uh, the child when you work with kids small age, very young children, um, adaptation of this is, you know, nowadays you have, this is after all, uh, Sunnyvale, right? Your uh, computer, uh, right? You could go with like this. Um, okay. And uh, what would it take? You know, where are you in this one? You can have up to 10 different faces, smiley faces, front smiley faces. What would it take to go for you to go from here to here? When you go from here to there, what would the teacher do different? What will your mommy do different? Or how will your friends notice? You know, that kind of stuff. That's another way to uh, adapt that with uh, small children. Um, there, uh, we meet some very creative uh, people. Recently, um, talk about this uh, group. Uh, by the way, group is becoming much more. Uh, group therapy is much more economically viable. And uh, a lot of these uh, HMOs and the managed care people like this group. Uh, but anyway, the way to adapt the scaling question to group setting, if you do group uh, uh, work, you could also do it this way. Uh, that stands for 10. And that stands for 1 or 0 in terms of how much progress you made or how you, where you want to be. This stands for where you want to be. And physically, they can sort of a, the group can get on the line and from 1 to 10. And then have you, each person or you know, the, each member of the group sort of a, take a position on where they're at between here and there. And you can also get them to talk about what it feels like to be over here. I don't like being here. I like being here. This is a progress for me. And then they can also say, what would it take for you to go from here to here? And children, you know, like this uh, kind of a very, you know, kids don't want to sit around and gab, talk all the time. They want to move. Uh, so it's a nice way to uh, get them to move around. And then you can also talk to each other about what it feels like to be over there and what it feels like to be over here. And how did I get here from here, from there to here, that kind of a adaptation. So again, we find that we are using more and more of the scaling question in many, many different ways. You could be very creative with that. It's a very uh, adaptable and very flexible. Uh, because essentially, uh, you know, people who don't, who are not very articulate, you don't have to be very articulate. All you have to know is somehow five is bigger than four, or five is better than four, or six is better than four, or something like that. You okay. Find when you do that with children, if they get into the good or bad thing because their friend Bob is over at the next uh, farther along the room, or. No, you don't want to go for you know good or bad, but it's like uh, you know where do you want to be? This is where I want to be. That means you know I don't have to come back to this group anymore. It's very oh, personal. absolutely. Very personal. And I like the scaling because it's uh, almost content-free. When they talk about I'm at 75, I have no idea. You don't have to talk about what 75 means for you. You just have to say 75. Um, and uh, what 75 stands for you, it's up to you. And so it's, I think it's for that reason I really like it because I don't have to know the details of clients' problems. Okay? Yeah. You don't have to. Okay. I think that. Uh, I'm sorry. What does a reflecting team mean? Uh, uh, the people who watch that, people who watch from behind you, along your uh, Yeah, yeah. Will give you the idea about comprehension. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. You don't have to have That's that. That's not what I thought. I think <laughs> realistically, in the real world out there, we don't have it. Um, the team is luxury. It is a luxury. The team mm -hmm. is a luxury. I think it's a good t uh, teaching tool. But it's not a therapy tool. Nice model for research and that sort of thing. So just take your time. I usually tell the clients, I'm going to take some time out. I'm going to walk out. I'm going to go sit in the next room. And I will think about your problem. They brought you here. 
and then I walk out. Mm -hmm. I'll be uh, back in 10 minutes. I talk to myself. Oftentimes, I do my paperwork when I'm out there sitting, thinking. Take my five minutes, 10 minutes, and you can do a lot of paperwork, get a lot of paperwork done in 10 minutes. Uh, okay. And then I come back, and, and uh, you know, clients will either go to the bathroom or take a cigarette or something, drink a water or something, and we meet again in 10 minutes. And uh, no. they are really eager. You should see their eyes when they when you come back in the room. Mm -hmm. uh, the taking a break uh, seems to be a rather key element of our approach. Hmm? I remember the first times we did that um, when I, without having a team behind the mirror. I remember the first time I was seeing this woman, and uh, she had been in therapy for 17 years, off and on with various therapists, and. After a half hour or so, I told her I wanted to take a break and go think about what she's been saying. And she, her face lit up. And she said, oh, you're the first therapist I've ever met who thinks. <laughs> um, that was the last session with her. She didn't need to come back anymore. <laughs> um, but I think it's very useful to get out of the room. Um, in order to punctuate this, uh, when you come back in, um, it's their turn to listen, and it's your turn to talk, hmm? which is the exact reverse of the previous section. Um, it also seems uh, quite clear that uh, if you don't take the break, um, and the clients tend to forget what the homework task was. So you have to re repeat it three times or more. If you don't take a break, then you have to repeat the homework task at least three times before they will remember it. But if you only say it once, they will forget it by the time they've walked out of the office. I we take a break in every session, yeah. yeah. Whether it be number one or number 27 or 56, if we ever had such a thing. Yeah. In practical terms, um, Clients have a waiting room that they could wait in. Yeah. If the clients are the ones, do you ever send the client out? Because well, sure. Uh, sure. Do you sure. do you sure. think that's a bad idea? No. It doesn't matter at all. Mm -mm. Usually the clients go out also. And we go to our room, they go out to the waiting room, or they go out in the, the most, they go out and go to the toilet and go have a, <laughs> uh, cigarettes or whatever it is they're into, you know. Who knows what they're doing out there sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to be using the time to think about it. No, oh, no, no, no. no. Um, but we've tried that, I think. Why don't we both, you know, what, I'm going to go think about what you should do and you should too. You know, we tried that sort of thing. They never have an answer. Yeah. And when we eavesdropped years ago, uh, we found out what they do during the break. Is, uh, if you have a family in there, they start talking about shopping for dinner. Things like this, and completely unrelated with the interview. Uh, so, best they can go out, do whatever they want. Doesn't matter. It takes time. It takes time. I think that it's some people learn it overnight. <laughs> um, Yeah, um, others never learn um, um, but it. I think that the, it's a deceptively simple. Mm -hmm. Deceptively simple. Well, I think Americans do make the serious mistake of equating simple with easy. Right. Simple is not easy. Simple is more difficult to do than more complicated ones. Because it takes a great deal of discipline to, sim to be simple. Mm -hmm. uh, if you know anything about uh, the either uh, Oriental painting or, uh, you know, I mean, uh, you don't have to go to Oriental painting. Picasso, Picasso's painting. The one that I like most about Picasso's, I think that, I'm sure you all have seen this. I've seen a lot of these posters. Uh, has a little back of a woman. Well, maybe that's what has it is. A little <laughs> Just there's a little one line and a dot. That's it. And it's the most sensuous, <laughs> most sexy, uh, you know, most, most erotic thing you have ever seen. It's just a one simple line. has a little 
stop. That's it. Or in another domain, Count Basie's piano playing. He used fewer notes per measure than anybody I ever heard. And he's, as I see it, he was structuring the space between the notes. But uh, yeah, it's uh, very, very simple. If you look at a transcription of his playing, and it's very simple. Oh, boy, you've got to be a master to play, do it. It took him years and years to figure out how he could to do it that simply. So simple is not easy. Yeah. Oh, I don't bother translating it into oh, what the I insurance did. company does. You, you see, no, wait, you, that's business. The, I do therapy. That's business. That's a different language. There's no translation between these two languages. I walk out the therapy door, and then I'm a businessman, and I do the fill out the form with the DSM-3. That's not therapy. That's business. Yeah. It's done in an entirely different room. Always. I don't make a translation. It's different operation entirely. You mean There's no what's translation. The, wait, wait. Uh, the intimation you get in the therapy room about the client's problem, how to translate that into DSM-3 or... Uh, I usually don't. I think that I have some idea. I, I know how to write um, the insurance forms. Yeah, we know their language. So you write we their know their forms language, and their right? language. And yeah. That's all it is. And we know what uh, category they will not pay. We know what category they will pay for. And so I, I know what to avoid. And I know what not to say, uh, that kind of stuff. And uh, it hasn't, uh, again, there is no correlation between what goes on in the therapy room and what you s write down on the insurance form. There is no correlation between the two. There's nothing to, one has nothing to do with the other. It's so just I'm thinking about how am I going to get paid? Yeah. 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 No, you can't. That's right. can't. You can't translate that. No, and I think that people try to. It's trying uh, to uh, describe a banana using the terms of, of uh, describing a chair. It just won't work. I don't think I had one. The most recent case we had this woman, uh, Nancy, Nancy had a kid. No, okay. Well, I, I would say that's the most uh, uh, unusual case we have run across. Yeah, I don't know if it was particularly time. difficult. But it was I don't think it was a challenge. It was a, um, well, go ahead. Okay, let me sort of describe to you. This woman comes to us from a physician sent by her family doctor. And uh, she's on uh, your medi cal, cal uh, medical or whatever you call it, CalMed or something, right? I don't remember. Yeah, Medicare in Wisconsin. Medical, I think it's called in California. And uh, Title 19. Uh, so she comes in with a long list of medications that she's on. She, she had a five by eight card. She had a card. Full of medications that she's on. What she's on for. And there are about seven, eight medications she's on. She presents this to us. And then she starts to having this anxiety attack in the, in the room, and she carries on, you know, crying and heaving, and she's panicking, you know, I mean, it's, it carries on. There clearly are exceptions, because she drives over to her parents' house. Her father had a stroke, so she takes care of her father, who was uh, physically abusive and sexually abusive when she was a child. And so she can drive over there to her father's, for, to her parents' house, but she falls apart, and uh, uh, she is just a basket case. She becomes a basket case at home. When she goes to a parent's house, she's, she very com she's running, competent running around to take a mother grocery store and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. She cannot go to a grocery right, store herself. Right, except when she goes to the grocery store with her, mo with her mother, right? Her then she's okay. Then she goes into the store, and mother sits in the car. She's okay. Yeah. So they're but, clearly, but when she goes grocery shopping for her own family, she can't go into the store. So there are lots of exceptions, but it doesn't mean anything to her because she said that's different. She said she's, that's, she said that's different. So I'm sort of, uh, how is that different? She cannot explain how is that different. She said it's just different. She said this is well, something I have to do. So we did a number of different things. It seemed like what happened to her was that 
any kind of, ex there was no ability to transfer any experience of success, translate success into somehow thinking of, of herself as successful piece. Yeah. She had okay. no memory for good, good for pleasant and good activities and su success. All she ever remembered was her failures. To make it as simple as possible. That's right. Huh? And she has this uh, boyfriend who lives with her. And the way she introduced it into the session that she had this boyfriend, what we thought was a new boyfriend. Hmm? And um, so we invited the boyfriend to come in because we didn't know what to do with this woman because there was no way that she could cognitively translate. Uh, like a learning does not take place. Right. It's almost it's like as if no, she never learned. Never anything. had successes. She talks as if. Uh, never experienced success in her life. On the other hand, she has a, she raised a twin, 14-year-old twins. You're getting ahead of the story, though. Very nice kids. Yeah. She says, they're very nice kids. So we are saying, how did you do that? He said, I just have bad, nice kids. Yeah. I just have very Miracle, nice kids. Miracle, right? That's what she says. So there's no ability to do that. So, so we bring in this boyfriend. Boy, boyfriend. It turns out he, he's been around for eight years. And he just adores her, he just adores her. And so she has these fits, these episodes of you know, hysterical crying and so on. Throwing things, throwing things breaking things, breaking and up she the just house, on. and he ignores it. So we're thinking, how could this be? I mean, how can a guy hang around a woman who does this three, four times a day? And they would last several hours, these hysterical outbreaks, using her words, or his words. Well, he didn't know. He couldn't answer it. He, no, he says, couldn't answer it. I'm just a different person. Yeah. She, she, Nancy is the way Nancy is. That's all there is to That's it. That's just the way it is. So then we decided we'll bring the kids in. Because we didn't know what to do with this woman. 14-year-old twins. 14-year-old twins come in. The nicest kids you have ever met. And we're looking at this. Yeah, third or fourth. Yeah. Fourth. No, I think it was a fourth session. Fourth. They had two with her by herself. That's yeah. right. That's so right. That was the fourth session. Yeah, fourth session. Yeah. And we were thinking, where did these nice kids come from? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and They're very they competent kids. Very competent They're kids. Doing well no in problem. school. They got friends. They go, you know, very active in their church and on and on and on. And what came across to us was her helplessness, her carrying on was um, the, her kids and all three, the boyfriend and two kids were hovering over her. Kids were parenting her and reassuring her, you know, you are a good mom. You know, you, you have done a good job with us. I mean, so she was doing a lot of this. So, so you could see this help, so I guess so-called this learned helplessness, how they controls, you know, this Haley's uh, writing in a, 50s and 60s, mm -hmm. textbook case example of that. So we didn't know what to do. So what but, occurred And, and these to kids it, were telling us that they always telling mother what a good mother she is. It doesn't register. It doesn't register at all. Mother is sitting there telling us that she's afraid she, the kids are going to think about her like she thinks about her father who, who abused her. Okay. So we came up with this homework assignment. And that was that the kids were, and they agreed, the kids agreed to do the homework. And the kids were to write down hmm, everything she did, everything mother did that was a, a, being a good parent, to write it down on a sheet of paper and tack it up on the walls in the, of the house. Everywhere. Everywhere and anywhere. And to, do this in every day. In a wall, back hall, cupboard, kit, the refrigerator the door. Refrigerator door. Everywhere. Everywhere. Living room, a dining room, everywhere. And whenever mother felt at a hysterical attack coming on, she was supposed to go and read these lists. Mm -hmm. And she did that. And the hysterical attacks started to diminish considerably. She said it was the best week she ever the had. The best week she's ever had in her entire life. 
And so, following our rule, we gave them, well, obviously, since it's working, do more of it. And um, we had another twist. What was the... We oh, had, yeah. Uh, the we had given her uh, one of those uh, file folder. And uh, so the, she was to take down, the kids were uh, to take it down after they have, and the kids did one, they brought it all uh, to They brought it all office. with them, they, all with this them. paper, you know, that they filled up the walls with. And they brought they it into the session. And they had a, this stack of stuff they brought with them, had a color coordinated, some oh, had yeah. a black, red lines, and some, and some used blue, the blue, and, and some had green. They were real creative, I mean, just real creative kids. And so we gave them a little folder, file folders, and she was to save all this in the folder. And whenever she felt this attack coming on, she was to go look at uh, through this all over again. And also kids were to continue to paste all these messages to her. Right, and she was to put it into the, the folder as soon as she had memorized the stuff on that list. She start, she's starting to remember things she does right now. What did, we, what did we ask Mike to do? Oh, he was to, every time he saw her getting upset, he was to do either take off his clothes or be crazy. You know, or do something uh, crazy. crazy. Right. Something yeah, yeah. crazy. Tickle, and tickle her. Or tickle whatever. her, right. And um, he thought that was a marvelous idea, and so did the kids. And, the kids uh, thought it was just absolutely fun. Yeah. So he was doing whatever he was doing. Um, and... Uh, and one other thing was uh, to help her, we, we instructed her, the kids to make a little sign about something mother did right and put it on the sun visor in the car so mother could remind herself. So when she got upset in the car, then she can pull it off, off the sun visor and take a look at it. The, also kids then, kids came up with the idea then they're going to make a little little smaller uh, little card, like a three by five card, and they're going to put it on a dashboard so that she can look at Various it. Various places in the car. So this no. was a woman that had some kind of a visual input, had a lot more impact on her than, than her listening. going through the ears. All the Jeez, stuff her ears listening. don't work properly, but her eyes seem to work a lot better than her ears. So somehow we caught on this. Um, Okay, no. all right. Maybe it is. Maybe it is NLP. I yeah, don't know. Well, but it goes beyond. I think that anyway. it was just one of, one of those situations we had to do something different. Yeah, right. Something, we had to do something different because it was, wasn't working. I was wondering that, um, that I was almost expecting you to do something paradoxical, such as to tell the family to start telling the mother that she hadn't been a good mother. Uh, because it, it, at first it sounded like, you know, writing down how wonderful you are almost seems like doing more of the same just in writing rather than saying. Um, but we don't do it that way. <laughs> and so we had the kids write down what the mother, Ma was doing right. And, you know, it seems to be working quite well. Yes. Uh, I'm very intrigued by what you, you would say, for example, in this case when you went out of the room uh, to think about the case and you were so confounded by what you were experiencing. Do you recall what, what you came back in then and s would say in a situation like this to the client? In the first session, yes. Yeah, I have no idea. It's a long time ago, and many, and it's a months ago and many clients ago, um, so. Oh, we were impressed with uh, how well you've described how painful things are for you. I, um, we're beginning to understand that this is a very, very painful situation for you and your children and so and so. But what puzzles us is the fact that these kids have been performing very well at school. We don't quite understand that. Therefore, you know, go home and you know, whatever we might have done as a homework assignment at that point. Observe what you do right vis-a-vis -vis the kids, yeah, something like that. Um, my, uh, some, my hunch is it will eventually affect that. I, at this point, no, we don't know. We aren't medical docs, so we can't even ask, you know. So you, you have to wait for her to volunteer that information. Yeah.
Uh, say that again. I'm, I didn't. Okay. No. All yeah. right. There's some, some format or outlines that we use um, in terms of when we come back with a message. What kind of a message we want to we want to give? Okay. The first one is we want to point out to the client what they are doing that is helpful, useful, and health he healthy. Whatever is healthy behavior. From the client's point of view. From the client's point of view, not from our point of view, but from client's point of view. Um, so that's the first thing we talk about. The, the second point is how difficult the problem is, the compli complex, difficult. complicated problem. And this is uh, probably a damn good time to show up in a therapist's office. Right. Okay. And you did the, the right yeah, thing. Right. So this is a good time to solve this problem. Uh, and then you can use this for uh, any kind of a developmental model. You can use that. You know, when you've been married two years, this is the common that this kind of issues come up, and it's the best time to solve this. Is you can make right up now. anything you want like that. Uh, good time to solve problem right now. This problem. Um, then I think that we talk about some uh, sort of thinking about the rationale for what they need to do next. The rationale for the home, whatever for homework assignment we might give. What the, you know, sort of like are we tracing their success? Um, and what the next step is? And this is the way to get to next step. And most tasks are framed as experiments. Yeah. Or hedged in some way. Perhaps you might maybe want to try doing this sometime. Always hedge it. We always hedge on this task. Uh, experiment. It's not an order. We don't it's not see a demand. that as a solution. We don't see this as a solution. We never say that. Uh, Do this and it will cure everything. As a way to find out, as a way to find out what the solution might be to this very complicated and complex problem. And it will probably take some hard work to get from here to where you want to go. You have to tell them that. You have to remind them, especially if you have a big sign that says it's brief therapy. You need to remind your clients it's going to be hard work. Yeah. Uh, and then if they're lucky, then it's okay. Yeah. But you don't want them to uh, think it's going to be easy. They know it won't be because they've had this thing they've been struggling for 20 years with. They know it's going to be hard work. They've been doing it. So these are some roughly sort of general way that we think about how the messages are structured. And but of course, you know, in all this is using the client language and all that. It's, it's, it's the same as the MRI approach. Okay, well, according okay. to the big clock on my wrist here. We have to stop? Yeah. Okay. All right, is there, is there one last question before we end? Phone call. My what? What phone calls? My phone calls. Almost never. Almost never. Yeah. We rarely get phone calls from session to session. Um, and I think the one, one of the nice things about this way, again, is that uh, you know clients take ownership of the solution. Yeah. Yeah. That's clients, entirely up to the client. It's the client does that. Mostly it, clients. It, no, no. It's up to the clients. We say, when do you want to come back? And we try and go with that. Two weeks. Normally two weeks apart. When clients some, decide. Some will pick six. Yeah. Four weeks, whatever. Okay. All Thank right. you very much. Bye -bye.